Was his groundbreaking work accepted or minimally accepted? Yeah, looking back over 50, 60 years of this stuff now, um, I'd say if, if it wasn't accepted, we would not have produced full-spectrum lights, even to the extent we have now. And so your medical doctor, I guess, is the proof of the pudding. You go into him in Seattle and you say, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. Uh, the doctor will very often say, go get a light box. <laughs> so what does that tell you? You know, So that's got to be accepted or the doctor wouldn't do the prescription. So they may not accept all the details, but essentially the thrust of you need sunlight has been accepted. And, and, and uh, sunlight used to treat TB and, uh, and psoriasis and a number of things. So his, I think his things are marginally accepted by the medical profession. <laughs> Very interesting. Talk a little bit about lighting that is... Bad. The bad lighting, and I wanted to say something in our conversation earlier today. You talked about the LED side, and you said that in Bruce Lipton's book on the oh, biology of belief, okay. I want you to talk about that point. Remember I said in, uh, the background of sunlight that you could actually reduce down to a single wave of light? Yes. Okay, that's what a laser and an LED produce, a single wave of light. And the game with LED light is that it was determined back in the 70s, 80s, actually a little bit in the 60s, that single wave light could affect cellular tissue. Now, this is different than like sunlight, which comes into your body and keeps you healthy and distributes all the light you need. But taking one wave of light and applying it to the body, to the tissues, uh, was really miraculous in the sense that it could kill pain. On, on a continuous setting, and if you turned it on and off rapidly, pulsed it, so to speak, um, it could stimulate rapid repair of tissue. So this was the advent of low-power lasers and LEDs. And the concept was this, that um, if you take your analogy here, if you take your television set... <clears throat> It has a sensor in it, and you have a remote control that's putting out, incidentally, a wave of infrared invisible light. So when you hit your remote control, it sends a wave of light to the TV sensor. The sensor responds only to the single wave light, and it turns on the electronics and the TV set works. Okay, every cell in our body operates the same way, that basically a single wave of light can activate any abnormal cell tissue while not affecting any healthy cell tissue. And the way it does this is that within a, if you picture a cell as a round circle, call it a typical cell, inside of it it has all the DNA and, uh, and uh, uh, DNA, RNA, mitochondria, proteins, that's everything that, that the cell needs to be alive. And um, for many years, it was presumed that the LED and laser light worked because the light would affect little sensors that were internal to the cell. And uh, it would, they would literally, when you sh put an LED or a, a laser on it, it would cause a, um, it would affect the sensor and the cell would immediately jumpstart like your TV set. And instead of turning on the electronics, it turned on the bioelectronics in your cell, and the cell proceeded to heal itself just like the TV continued to stay on. Well, Bruce Lipton came along with his book, Biology of Belief. He's a microbiologist and said, hey, the brains of the cell are not inside they're on the outside. That's why we call it a membrane, <laughs> because all these sensors are located, and he showed how they function. So our body, each cell, has a load of sensors on the outside, and these sensors is how the cell communicates with its environment. It's the equivalent of our eyes, ears, nose, etc. So basically, the uh, cells respond only when they're damaged or abnormal. It's like if you 
shined an LED light on cell tissue that's healthy, it's like trying to turn on a TV that's already on. Whereas if the cell is damaged, these sensors actually respond, where they ignore it if they're healthy. If they're damaged, they respond. They turn on literally the cell's dynamics, and the cell proceeds to heal itself. When the cell is done healing, it no longer responds to light. How is this used, for example? You have an LED unit that you developed, right? A phototherapy unit. Yeah. LED lights, um, literally what you do is you put LED lights over areas where you have medical problems or pain or virtually anything in it. Um, I'm going to kind of capsulize this because if we could do um, an, another whole show on just the LEDs and, and their advantage in there. We've kind of stayed pretty much to sunlight, full spectrum light, etc. But basically, LED lights can penetrate uh, effectively up to six, eight inches in the body, depending on the size and strength of the unit. Um, and they can activate cells. So basically, LED units that contain um, oh, pulse settings and solid settings can be used for pain relief for solid and, and accelerated healing on pulse. Wasn't it NASA who discovered this? No. Well, NASA came across it. Uh, we started in 1985. R- Russia started in the late 70s, and uh, early 70s, actually. And uh, they discovered the advantage of single-frequency light. NASA came on the scene in the year 2000 and said, oh, these things work. We'll use them to heal our astronauts in space. Uh, astronauts who get injured in space don't heal because of weightlessness. And since LEDs spur a quick healing, NASA came along and said, hey, these are applicable to our astronauts. And so there was information published in National Geographic about NASA using these, and and that uh, went from LEDs being less known than the effects of sunlight uh, <laughs> to everybody wants to learn about LEDs now because of NASA. And that's what's happened. Uh, the whole LED game has proliferated from the year 2000 up to now. And, uh, but there was so much work done for 25 years prior to that on LEDs, they just weren't really well known. Talk for a minute about the fact that China owns practically all the manufacturing of light bulbs, even in America. Yeah. Um, manufacturing facilities have always migrated to the lowest cost of producing light. And so it used to be uh, Europe, and then it used to be Mexico, and then it migrated to China. So in today's world, China produces virtually all of the world's use of light, certainly all of the United States. So we better be nice or they'll turn off the lights. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it you know, all full-spectrum lights also came from China, and uh, recently... Uh, Full-spectrum lights have been really scarce for the last four months or so, uh, actually five months, because China wasn't able to switch gears and quit producing the incandescent bulbs and the standard compact fluorescents that are not full-spectrum. And so the uh, man, the distributors here putting in orders to China have now, at China's discretion, been out of bulbs for six months, all these healthy ones. Oh, my God. And now, the same thing could happen with any lighting bulb <laughs> if, if China chose to restrict things for technical reasons, you know? Why can't we manufacture full-spectrum light bulbs here in America? Why? We can. Uh, I mean, why have we offshored any manufacturing? It's cheaper. Uh, it's more expensive to do it here. The only reason, I mean, we had the facilities to do it. We can create them again. The question is uh, the economics. Um, people want to buy their incandescent light bulb for three for a dollar. <laughs> And uh, so we can't produce them three for a dollar. And the same thing goes for things like full spectrum, that uh, people don't want to pay 
$10, $11 for bulbs. 